we will call on you for your guidance. As we came on, we conducted a survey that revealed to us that the School of Medicine faculty and staff are engaged in at least 38 different countries uh, shown here. This work is balanced across missions, education and capacity building, research, as well as clinical and service initiatives. In addition, a query of international grants and contracts with both low and high income countries showed tremendous growth since uh, 2015 with a number of 29 grants and contracts corresponding to $45 million. And now at least 40 corresponding to $68 million. So Mike, you've shown us that there is room to grow and exceed even 100 million in the next few years. But why should we do this work? This is a slide that I borrowed from my global health collaborators in Cameroon, where I started my own uh, work and uh, training and initial work as a, a missionary doctor. This is borrowed from Drs. Thomas Welty and Pius T, who may be online with us, and says the task is great, but together we can do it. The woman pushing the rock with a local partner was Dr. Laura Edwards, a maternal fetal medicine specialist like myself, who spent her career in India and then subsequently in Cameroon when, he was kicked, when she was kicked out of India, working on maternal mortality issues. an issue which continues to be a problem in the world and a problem, a prior priority problem here in the US currently. Sadly, she and a colleague while doing this work died in a road traffic accident in Cameroon, another major public health issue. Her mentees, have gone on to develop some of the largest healthcare systems, HIV care and perinatal prevention programs, and cervical cancer screening programs in the country. We want to work with our partners to plant many seeds like she did. And again, as you know, there are many shared global priorities that make the task challenging, but also offer opportunities for synergy. With the transformational naming donation from the Hersing family of over a hundred million, naming our school of medicine, the Global Health Initiative becomes the Mary Hersing Institute for Global Health with a generous in investment to boost our global health work. And I want to thank everyone who did the upfront work uh, to make this uh, happen, including Dr. Vickers. As I have spoken with global health leaders over the past few weeks, I have been reminded of several core themes that should drive our work the connectedness or interconnectedness of our populations, COVID as a perfect example of that, the need for equity and mutual respect, 
in, in what is called, now called the age of decolonization of global health, wherein initiatives should offer equal or greater benefit and leadership opportunities to our global partners. Wherein we adhere to nothing about us without us. It's also been underscored the need for bi and multi-directional and transdisciplinary efforts, which is something that UAB uh, believes in. And so the question that's uh, recurring to us is how can our global partners, and many of you online today, participate meaningfully in this institute? And so we hope to continue to have this uh, conversations. We have identified a number of goals that I will now outline and will continue to re refine over the next several weeks and months into a strategic plan for the next five years. And we request and value the input of our partners here at uh, the School of Medicine at UAB and, and frankly, all over those 38 countries. So the overarching goal is to improve overall health and well-being and promote equity in health uh, outcomes among people around the world. We aim to have a coordinated, comprehensive and sustainable infrastructure uh, from which the Hersing uh, School of Medicine, UAB and international partners can foster educational opportunities and conduct high quality biomedical research and provide bi-directional and multi-directional services, capacity building and mutual support toward uh, addressing some of the most pressing and complex global health uh, challenges, some of which uh, we have talked about. While we underscore the biomedical approach in the School of Medicine, it is really crucial to recognize that transdisciplinary collaboration across all areas is essential um, for success. So as a vision, healthy people, healthy lives around the world, the values are essentially the values that uh, UAB puts forth of integrity, mutual respect, diversity, and inclusiveness collaboration, excellence, innovation, uh, st stewardship and accountability for the resources we have. And I was encouraged uh, yesterday to hear our uh, donor family, the Hersing family, summarize this as gift. Gratitude, inclusiveness, values shown here, and excellence. So we have three main strategic goals. The first one is to promote global health scholarship and develop scholars in global health. Um, as a priority, we want to develop uh, postgraduate educational programs, including a master's of science in global health somewhere within the next uh, two to three years uh, to get the first enrollment. We want to partner with our collaborative network already uh, here at UAB and bring this into other global uh, consortia especially the uh, collaboration with McMaster University and a global consortium that includes the uh, universities around the world shown here. We, would, we plan to develop a global scholars program that will engage faculty, trainees in multiple areas and increase the level of communication, information and intensity around uh, global health. We want to do this here at UAB, but we also want to make sure our partners are very involved and uh, participating in this process. The second goal is to promote a multi-directional, a multinational research service and capacity building uh, program in global health that brings together a coordinated network and infrastructure linking UAB and our partner, country, faculty members, staff, trainees, available facilities, and including especially data analytic capacity and uh, bandwidth. 
we want to use this uh, platform to address some of the key problems that we face today. Testing innovation, innovative solutions, and including large scale multinational uh, studies. We already do, do large scale uh, multi center studies uh, at UAB. There is a tremendous opportunity to leverage telehealth and la laboratory and imaging and service, uh, rather, service and capacities to improve access and quality and a sustainable income generation platform for our partners and for us to continue to do this work. And as Dr. As Dean Vick has mentioned earlier, talking about the need for travel and through that travel, have an initiative that can inform and continue to promote appropriate health information, just given the current age of uh, information that may not always be uh, to the best of our interest or to the best of our knowledge. The third goal is really how do we make all these two key goals happen? How do we keep a level of activity going on uh, to nucleate around research, education, and service, to bring about uh, coordination of activities in the School of Medicine, but also with our partners here at UAB, at other institutions, and uh, most importantly, our partners uh, abroad. Have a committee that will bring around enthusiasm and drive this process partner with uh, departments and divisions. And uh, later on, uh, towards the end of this program, I'm gonna talk about some of the things we are already doing and working with departments to figure out uh, areas where we can work together and help promote uh, this work. What do we hope to accomplish uh, through these goals? To have a world-renowned Institute of Global Health and an educational program that attracts and is a destination of a competitive pool of faculty and applicants to bring diverse trainees, diverse trainees from here in the US and a global hub network countries and have them become leaders in global health and especially those from underrepresented groups as well as from low and medium middle income countries. To have this multinational framework to address problems across missions and to increase our ability and funding to be able to, to do this. And ultimately to bring about change and improvements in uh, health, in practice, in policies, and then improve health outcomes. So I would like to thank the team, a new team that's coming together. Uh, Dr. Lynn Matthews, I'll talk about uh, Lynn in a short order. Michelle Fies, who's already had a tremendous, uh, done a tremendous work coordinating multinational projects. Uh, Patricia Smith, who has done a yeoman's job helping us put together this program and doing so virtually. It's an amazing team and I look forward to working with each and every one. And Michelle Lee, who just joined us in the past uh, two weeks and already um, uh, got working. We are looking for an associate director to uh, work on, an, on educational programs um, from the School of Medicine perspective. And I will speak to this later as we partner with the Sparkman Center for Global Health and the School of Public Health to boost uh, global health uh, training. So I want to say thank you all and I look forward to a very bright future uh, working to improve global health. I would like to end with this. The task, the task is great, but together we can do it. So thank you all for joining. And I will go ahead and uh, our contact information, please reach out to myself and to uh, Dr. Matthews, but I would like to go ahead and bring Dr. Matthews uh, to the podium 
uh, to talk about what we plan to do uh, with respect to partnerships. So Dr. Matthews is an associate professor and director of global health in the division of infectious diseases here at UAB, Nelson School of Medicine. And as of July, as indicated, she is working with me as the associate director for global health partnerships and research for the Globe Schools uh, Initiative. Dr. Matthews grew up in Florida, completed her undergraduate training in Swarthmore, around Pennsylvania, an MD at the University of Miami, internal medicine at Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital, Infectious Disease Fellowship at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and has an MPH from Harvard. In addition to her formal training, and this is really important, she has sought multiple opportunities uh, to gain expertise in HIV work and global health, including as a community health educator in Honduras, she spent a year working with NIH on immune response to HIV, multiple rotations in Rwanda during residency and fellowship, spent a year as a clinician in South Africa, and then returned there to develop a research program focused on sexual and reproductive health, health for people living with and exposed to HIV. She was a faculty at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School from 2011 until she joined us in 2019. Uh, Dr. Matthews is well funded by NIH and continues to do work um, in her area of interest. So Dr. Matthews, once again, thank you. And uh, let's hear from you. Thank you. Great, thanks everyone. Um, and I'm just gonna do a quick overview of sort of what we're thinking so far in terms of global health partnerships at UAB moving forward. Um, and I'd like to just thank everyone for being here and for participating and to our online community that is now 75 participants, very exciting. Um, and thank you all for communicating via the chat when the sound left. So we're all Zoom experts now. Um, so as Alan reviewed, we have a lot of activities around the world. And based on that survey data and listening sessions we've had with folks around the School of Medicine, it's really interesting to see just how broad that spectrum of activity is. And so if we look at kind of what people are doing in the space of service, that ranges from direct clinical care. It's a lot of surgeons doing global health care in under-resourced areas. There are orthopedists and radiologists and neurologists and neurosurgeons who are doing telehealth with their global health partners. There are providers who are doing research with providing training to um, evaluating different ways to support community health workers, doing all sorts of different activities around the globe. And then there are people who are also doing work in terms of kind of contributing to advisory boards and panels. In our research realm, there's a lot, or education realm, there's tons of mentorship happening. There's a lot of formal teaching. I think the, the Gorgas Institute is sort of the um, gold standard for that, but there's tons of, tra of training programs happening and then also capacity building within hospitals and training. And then on the research side, folks are doing everything from basic science to clinical trials to behavioral science to population health and implementation science. And as we were planning this event, there's no way that I could give um, a real overview of all of this work, which is why the next session part of this open house is um, folks giving kind of a six minute global health spotlight on their work. Um, and we've asked people from a variety of programs that are both established and more emergent from different parts of the world to, to give that overview. So that'll happen next. And we're really looking forward to that. I think the other thing is when I tried to sort of give an overview of what's going on, I kind of automatically organize it as this title says into education, research, and service. But in fact, from our survey and from reading about your programs, everyone is actually doing a mix of everything. Um, so it's very exciting. And I think figuring out how to really leverage programs in order to achieve all of the goals is something that Alan and I are very excited about. Um, so from that global health survey and the listening sessions, you all have asked us to increase global health research, service and education opportunities, promote existing programs and amplify opportunities for everyone to collaborate, embrace an interdisciplinary approach, lots of suggestions about how we could better support junior faculty and trainees who are just getting started in this work. And there's a lot of asks for administrative support for global health processes around um, contracts, HR, IRB. So I'm a 
bit of a behavioral scientist and I can't give a talk without a conceptual framework. And so as I was reading your thoughts and thinking about what resources we have in this Global Institute of Health, you know, what's very clear is that what UAB has in spades is individuals, clinicians, investigators who have great research questions, training needs, service inspiration. And most people have a pretty good team that includes colleagues, trainees, and some administrative support to help them achieve their individual level goals. But to really do the work, people also need support at the community level in terms of their health systems, HR, IRB, contracts, legal work with grants offices, and at the structural level, funding priorities, what are the research priorities, what do people want to fund, what are people funding. And so I think that what our team can do is really help push on some of the community and structural factors to help the individuals and the teams get the work done that you are already doing very successfully. So going back to what you've asked for so far, what we've been able to do is in terms of promoting opportunities, we're working with departments and divisions to identify their needs, leads for this work and opportunities. We're also establishing an interdisciplinary and global advisory board that in, and a steering committee to help develop some of these programs. And Alan mentioned the MSC program work. And that also speaks to the interdisciplinary work. In terms of promoting programs, we're doing things like this. Um, an opportunity to share the work that's going on across the institution. We're also working on a website that I believe launched sometime last night. Um, and uh, we're gonna be hosting symposia. And then in terms of supporting junior faculty and trainees, we're working on a pilot funding RFA now. We're going to be offering grants review support for people who are submitting global health grants and don't have a lot of mentorship in that space. And we're pulling together our administrative team to help support some of the program coordination and travel. Um, so that's what we're doing so far. Um, I think that, you know, global health partnerships in this COVID-19 informed world present some familiar challenges as well as some new challenges. I think there's been, a, we know there's been a lot of lost ground in our all around the world in terms of health goals and targets, healthcare systems, economies, a lot of leaders in this space, um, we have lost them to COVID. There's a lot of eroded trust in what global health partnerships mean. We, despite our desire, have not been able to end vaccine apartheid. Um, and there are a lot of broad critiques of global health colonialism coming out of, of this experience we're having with COVID. And a lot of people are also anticipating some global health funding austerity to come. But I think on the hopeful side, justif justification for healthcare access and quality health for all is very clear. And even if you don't care about that in terms of a social justice framework, you might care about it from an economic framework or from a security framework. And I think that we've seen that there is solidarity and there is much to do. So what's the vision for our global health partnerships and research? Really to, to be honest about those challenges and advocate for change where we can. Um, I'm also embracing hope, I think, because UAB is a younger university and the Global Health Initiative is a newer venture. We can be a bit more nimble and we can try to change some of our structures. Um, there is a School of Medicine-wide commitment to anti-racism, anti-colonialism. These, these issues in global health are also very local for Alabama. Um, UAB community and leadership is very enriched for people with lived, minoritized, and international experience, which only helps us. And we have long-standing, meaningful relationships with global health partners who have deep knowledge, experience, and wisdom around this. So my goal is to keep listening and learning and asking for your help. Um, and with that, I'm going to pause. And I think, Alan, we can take a couple of questions before we go to the global health spotlights. Um, questions can come from this room, or I will um, go to the chat and also... Um, here. I see. Um, so um, let me see if there are questions. Um, Alan, Robert Chunzo from Cameroon is asking, how does one start collaborating with the Global Health Initiative as an individual or as an institution? That's a really great uh, Maybe question. come to the mic because it's hard to yeah. hear. So it's great to hear from Dr. Chunzo, who is uh, frankly a classmate of mine from 20 years ago uh, here. Um, yes, uh, we have a Cameroon uh, Health Initiative already ongoing with affiliations uh, to the Cameroon Baptist Convention Health Services and uh, with the University of Boyer. 
and there are ways that individuals can partner with these ongoing uh, initiatives already based on their interests to uh, do uh, joint work that moves uh, us along. Um, now, if uh, you currently represent an institution, uh, then we can also link with you um, as the Cameroon Health Initiative to see how a, a partnership could be formulated. And this applies to any other uh, country where we, where we currently work or where we have a UAB faculty engaged. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions in the room? If not, we can move on. We're not ahead of time. All right. So um, let me actually just grab one more cheat sheet I have. All right. So the Global Health Spotlights are going to be six minute rapid fire discussions of programs happening across the School of Medicine um, presented by their leads. Um, we've asked people to focus on their mission, their activities and opportunities for collaboration. Um, and the first uh, spotlight will be presented by Drs. Albert Manassian and Wally Carlo. Dr. Manassian is an associate professor in neonatology, and Dr. Carlo is a professor and endowed chair and co-division director of neonatology. Um, Dr. Manassian, are you on? Yes, I am. Great. Um, so I'm going to share your slides, and I think if I stop talking, um, you will come up as the speaker. So I'm going to mute my... Thank you very much. I would turn on my camera, but we're having a slow internet day here. Um, so I don't want to risk it and be disconnected. That's fine. If you want to just speak, I will start going through your slides. And let me know when to start. Yeah. You can go ahead. Perfect. Can you see your slides? Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. And first and foremost, thank you for the opportunity to present our division 10 plus years uh, of work that we have been doing in Zambia and globally. Um, so our mission is to reduce maternal and child mortality and morbidity and improve systems of maternal and child health care in low middle income countries. Most of our studies that we'll be presenting today utilize a mixed methods approach using both quantitative and qualitative data collection for a deeper understanding, including the use of implementation research tools for the development of novel approaches. So our very first study was conducted in 2006, where we evaluated the effectiveness of the WHO essential newborn care and neonatal resuscitation training programs on neonatal mortality and stillbirth rates. This was our first trial within the global network, the NICHD funded network, which we are still part of 15 years later. And the study was conducted in health facilities and communities. And this is an important component because in the facilities, we trained healthcare providers and the communities, we trained traditional birth attendants. Um, the intervention led to a reduction, a 50% reduction in early neonatal mortality and around 30% reduction in stillbirth rate. We later on did a cost effectiveness analysis and the intervention showed to be very incredibly cost effective, less than $2 uh, per daily, which was presented, uh, which was published and presented in the um, New York Times back in the days. Um, the brain study followed where we randomized asphyxiated and non-asphyxiated babies into two groups. Interventions uh, where they received fortnightly interventions by the parent guardians and the control group where they received counseling. Study participants were followed for 36 months and were evaluated using the Bailey scale and infant and toddlers development tool. Findings showed that the asphyxiated babies performed as well as the non-asphyxiated babies, but also furthermore, during the early developmental phase, we noticed that the asphyxiated babies had an IQ approximately five points higher than those who were not asphyxiated at birth. Um, our uh, next study is the hypothermia study, which we, uh, which we plan on doing at several sites, um, looking at low cost and interventions for skin to skin and developing a low cost incubator to reduce neonatal hypothermia. Um, the recent study is the azithromycin trial to be, which is being implemented in seven countries where we are evaluating the impact of the medication on vertical transmission of pathogens and consequently neonatal mortality. 
Um, a secondary study was the use of the AI algorithms, artificial intelligence algorithm, um, where the team identified risk factors leading to poor perinatal outcomes. Um, can we go to the next page, please? I will go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, the premi study, which was funded by the Elma Foundation, evaluated the impact of a package of five interventions on neonatal mortality among preterm births in Zambia. Uh, the CDC detect study funded by CDC um, utilized a novel community model for identification and testing of an HIV, uh, testing of HIV exposed infants who had dropped out of care. The Saving Mothers Giving Life program strengthened obstetric and newborn services in several districts within Zambia, Nigeria, and Uganda. Uh, we're all aiming at reducing maternal and perinatal outcomes. Um, then here we diversify away from the MCH research and present our work in the field of cervical cancer. The binocular study estimated the sensitivity and specificity of a handheld colposcope, high-risk HPV using the Gene Expert platform and VIA, so visual inspection with acidic acid. Um, the study ended a few months ago, so we're doing the data analysis at the moment. Furthermore, the same study did, is developing an AI algorithm for the early identification of women with cancers and precancerous lesions. We're doing this in partnership with Switzerland, the uh, University of Bern. Similarly, with the same team, um, the ACHIEVE study is looking for bottlenecks, facilitators, and barriers in cervical cancer screening in Zambia. And lastly, the cervical cancer program that we have is uh, the linkage study, which is a capacity building program that is developing a training program for probabilistic linkage in Zambia, <clears throat> excuse me, in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. And this um, program is conducting linkages between the cervical cancer database, the national cervical cancer database, and the national ART databases, looking at the whole continuum of care. May we go on to the next slide, please? And here uh, we'll talk about our pilot studies and the planned studies. Um, among our pilot studies, we are currently conducting a diagnostic accuracy study of a low cost pulse oximeter compared to the gold standard Massimo, which was funded by the Sparkman Center. Um, it's being led by Dr. Norris Vichenko. We are preparing to conduct an RCT evaluating the individual components of the ECEB protocol, essential care for every baby protocol. Furthermore, we plan on doing a pilot study to evaluate the impact of caffeine citrate on neonatal mortality in Zambia. And from Q1 of 2022, which we already have the funding for, we will begin a new trial evaluating the impact of high volume breast milk on postnatal growth restriction in Zambia. Um, lastly, we are planning several studies ranging from evaluating antiseptics on vertical transmission of multi-drug resistant pathogens um, in Zambia impact of an mHealth platform on early developed identification of pregnant women who are victims of intimate partner violence, which we are doing with uh, working on with the University of Zambia, um, strengthening midwife-led birthing centers for reduction of maternal and unit mortality throughout the country, um, and implementation science award in the field of cervical cancer, and lastly, a development and validation of a low-cost HPV platform that will be conducted here in Zambia in partnership with the CIDRS Central Laboratory. Um, thank you very much. I hope I made it within the six minutes. That was an amazing overview of a phenomenal body of work presented from the field of neonatology. Um, so really exciting. And I hope people are taking notes on who wants to collaborate and help move that work forward because it's a lot to do. Okay, our Thank next speaker is Dr. Audrey Stein. Um, he is a professor in the Department of Microbiology at UAB, and he's also come, he also is at the Africa Health Research Institute. But today, lucky for us, he's in Birmingham. So Audrey, please come. It seems that the slides are only advancing with this, not with this. Research. Thank you very much for that introduction, Lynn. I'm gonna start straight off. I have a few very simple slides. How do I do this? Okay, there it is. Just to orientate yourself, uh, the Africa Health Research Institute, or ARI as it's known, is located in Durban on the east coast of South Africa, west of Madagascar. Tropical climate, coastal city, we have beautiful beaches. We are approximately one hour by plane from Johannesburg, two hours uh, by plane uh, from Cape Town, and of course, uh, from Johannesburg to Atlanta, you have 16 hours. Um, you can watch all the movies you want to. 
Uh, besides myself, jeez. Uh, okay. Okay, besides myself, it was uh, recruited many years ago here to UAB. More recently, UAB also recruited Emily Wong from, uh, from SGN, which is also seconded to um, Ari. She's just one floor um, above my laboratory. And so UAB has a strong uh, faculty footprint in South Africa. We're also well integrated um, uh, with other TB groups. Just getting the camera on you. We moved the camera. The okay. last thing, sorry, I want them to be able to see. Okay, the actual time is. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So we well integrated with other TB group scientists um, in South Africa, including um, faculty at the University of Stellenbosch, which is close to Cape Town, University uh, of Cape Town or UCT. And then I have to point out one uh, recent success story is our uh, collaboration with SMU University close to Pretoria. And there Mike Sack and the UAB CIFAR was instrumental in obtaining their first ever uh, NIH funded grant was an R01. In a nutshell, some of these faculty were flown over to UAB. We met in a room here and we wrote uh, this R01 in two weeks and we submitted it and we were successful. It's a multi-PI uh, grant. I'm one of the PI here at UAB and my colleague is the other PI at um, SMU University. This is a major success story, um, but it comes with a lot of work. Um, we're fortunate to have access to this building, which was built by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in 2012. It was completed, seven stories, every floor has a, a BSL-3, and the top level is a complete BSL-3 wing with amazing um, uh, instrumentation. So the building was not only completed, but it was also fully equipped with all state-of-the-art analytical type platforms. So we're very fortunate. Um, Two hours north from Durban, we have a second campus, which is called the Sonkele campus, where um, we have access to a population-based cohort of approximately 130,000 people, which has been well characterized, well studied for the past 20 years. Uh, and a lot of the faculty tap into this uh, cohort, especially Emily Wong. And she launched this uh, very successful Bugazazi program. That's just to give you an idea on the mobile clinics in the rural area. Um, we have mobile x-ray machines, and there's just a visit, site visit uh, we had. And she was very successful, uh, and her study resulted in, you know, two papers published in Lancet Global Health, as well as in Nature Digital and Medicine. So she's making really um, a major impact uh, in some Kelly. This is just to illustrate that we can move science from bench to bedside. We can do the basic uh, uh, science, but also... Um, do health intervention type studies or epidemiology, social sciences, et cetera. So there's uh, multiple opportunities uh, for doing science here uh, at ARI, and this has been refined and developed over the past 10 years, um, which resulted in multiple cohorts that support translational TV science. And I don't have to emphasize that TV is still a major global problem. Millions of people die every year, one person every 20 seconds approximately. Unfortunately, we know more about TB in animal model systems, TB in mice and in zebrafish than we know TB in humans. And that is simply a fact. Um, that represents us with really unique opportunities to study the real disease in humans. Um, it's the only place, as far as we know, in the world where human TB can be routinely studied. We have routine access, three to four freshly resected lung tissue samples per week that we have in South Africa which we can study. Okay, and this is just an example of a TB infected lung, the massive necrosis and open book section of a TB lung. We see this once a week. Um, relevant to this program uh, is the establishment of a clinical trials unit at RE. Uh, with a with uh, sole purpose of testing drugs, vaccines, diagnostics in the Somkele uh, cohort, which again represents uh, unique opportunities for training of faculty, staff, students, etc., and performing cutting edge research. So we're fortunate, both myself and, and uh, Emily, to be well funded uh, via several NIH awards, as well as the Gates Foundation, and more recently a Delta Leap Award, which kicked in about a month ago 
4.3 million to study uh, human TB. My last slide, oh, well, second last slide, just to illustrate every year for the past 10 years, I had three to four summer students from UAB that visited uh, our my lab there. They get heavily involved in um, a variety of research activity, but we, the point I wanna make is we don't have to stand back for the Yales and the Harvards and you know, the Hopkins. These are amazing students. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. I think two or three of them are actually practicing clinicians here in Birmingham. We have an amazing time um, exposing them to really major cutting edge TB research. This is in front of the Albert Lothuli Hospital, one of the central uh, flagship hospitals in KZN, about 10 minutes away from Ari. Uh, that's inside the hospital and they're also doing uh, bench science. My last slide is just to illustrate uh, one of the pillar programs uh, at, uh, at Ari is the human lung program. Uh, we obtain these freshly resected lung tissue samples from two hospitals about 10 minutes away from Ari via courier. They've been transported to Ari, which we, uh, within one hour, we get these tissue samples, we analyze them in the BSL-3. Naturally, uh, we are well, uh, we have multiple collaborations with the cardiothoracic surgeons, forensic pathologists, anatomical pathologists. The whole system provides really ample opportunity for training, exposing students, faculty, and staff uh, to this type of TB program. Many of these samples are infected with MDR and XDR, which remains a, um, is a challenge, but we have the necessary biosafety facilities to study it. That's just to illustrate you a formalin fixed human lung tissue sample, those white lesions, these are tubercles. Um, that is the sole focus of our science. And that's a freshly resected lung sample. You can see when you cut the lung open, the tubercles just peeling out. And these studies culminated in our most recent study where we, for the first time, described the 3D structure of the human tuberculosis granuloma. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for being here and all this work. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Christopher Green. He's going to be presenting um, from Zoom, I see his face now, um, talking about the Department of Emergency Medicine's Office of Global Health. Dr. Green is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and Global Health here at UAB. Good morning, everyone. You can go to the next slide. That's fine. Um, so we, uh, I'm representing our, our Office of Global Health um, within our Department of, of Emergency Medicine. Um, we are about eight years old. Um, and have trained um, uh, nine fellows so far. Um, you know, uh, emergency medicine is a relatively new specialty in the U.S. Um, and internationally. Um, and, and, and is, um, while it's increasingly prevalent that um, I think that there's recognition for the need for emergency specialists and resuscitation specialists uh, internationally, it's something that is certainly a growing need and and a big part of our. Um, work is is awareness of this so in the 2020 as of 2020 trauma and cardiovascular disease um have become primary causes of morbidity and mortality internationally and then specifically in low and middle income countries um some of the things that we focus on as a, as a group um in our training program um, is sepsis management pre-hospital care um, kind of the golden hour of resuscitation um and triage and then resuscitation uh science as well um, we have, uh, we have recognized, and I think it's pretty, pretty well known, there's a, a lack of access to adequate cessation in low middle income countries, and similarly, a lack of training programs for emergency specialists in those places as well. Um, some of the challenges, uh, as, uh, when we talk about you know, translational education, um, is that there are unique disease processes that are, uh, very regionally specific, um, and certainly supplies and medications can be, Limited. There are obviously sociocultural opportunities as well as barriers, um, um, and many of the guidelines uh, that exist are, you know, whether they derive from the WHO or, or um, the CDC or from um, the American College of Emergency Physicians, are limited by some of these challenges. Um, and so, the the primary mission of our group has been to improve the delivery of acute care and emergency medicine um, um, in low and low and middle income countries. Um, through education, partnership, research. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. So you go to the next slide, please. So we have um, essentially three um, 
major fellowships um, that we have had, that we have graduated fellows um, through in our, in our, within our program. Um, the most uh, common fellowship that we um, have people participate in is the is our one year fellowship in, in international emergency medicine and global health. Um, part of the fellowship includes um, um, getting a, a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene, and that's through our partnership with the Gorgas Institute um, here at UAB. Um, additionally, we do uh, have them do extra training with the um, humanitarian um, response intensive course. At, uh, it's a Harvard-based program um, where our fellows learn to work with NGOs um, and, uh, and in a disaster response uh, setting, which is a, a very common reason that emergency physicians get um, pulled from the U.S. to, to collaborate with uh, providers internationally. Um, and additionally, we do, they do a global health certification through the UAB School of Public Health um, within, with the purpose of introducing them to uh, public health principles. Um, in addition to this, we do um, kind of um, bedside training with our fellows um, in emergency medicine at, at multiple sites um, and providing acute care in uh, resource limited settings within low and middle income countries. Um, typically at, because emergency medicine is a hospital based specialty, typically at sites that are um, we're familiar with and we've worked with, um, we have a long ongoing, ongoing relationship with. Um, and uh, Matt Hyman is the director of that fellowship. Um, additionally, we have a two-year fellowship um, in both international emergency medicine and ultrasound, specifically tropical ultrasounds combined fellowship. Um, um, the director of that is, is Luke Burleson. Um, and in addition to the other, um, you know, fellowship requirements of the of the one-year fellowship, they also do some specific ultrasound fellowship certification as well as um, with a with a unique, very unique concentration in tropical and neglected disease. Dr. Burleson teaches that. Um, and then more recently, our, we've graduated. Our, we're graduating our first fellow. Who will she will be graduating this spring um, in a combined uh, both social emergency medicine and global health. And this is, um, um, while it contains some of the similar elements, also has a, a, a focus on public health, acquiring a master's in public health, as well as a focus on both domestic and international um, um, uh, socially specific um, problems that present the emergency department. Um, we know that the the ER is a place that um, you know we, we call it the kind of the the it, it's definitely a safety net for um, the medical community, um, not just in the U.S. but internationally. Um, and so many of the things that present to emergency rooms um, don't seek medical care um, elsewhere. And so trying to focus on some of these things. So domestic domestically, this has um, these are issues like HIV and hepatitis C, um, both. Um, uh, with surveillance and diagnosis and, and linkage to treatment. Um, and we have a, and this is a, a, a new and burgeoning part of our, our program. You can go to the next slide. Um, our fellowship program is primarily um, a clinical educational program. Um, and uh, and uh, we have partnered with a, a number of other institutions to do um, both emergency medicine and clinical conferences ongoing training, um, capacity building, um, and we are uh, currently in the development of a medical student course, which we'll offer this spring. Um, we have uh, ongoing lectures with our fellows and also fellows from a number of other uh, institutions, including UK. Um, um, and then we also have, um, are involved with our, our national conference in leadership and education. Um, we have, our fellows have, have worked at sites and collaborated with sites um, in a number of countries, as you see here. Um, both of our fellows are currently, or one, sorry, one of our fellows is, which one just got back, one is currently in uh, Zambia. Um, we also have roles within the hospital here that are kind of unique to our group, both with the serious special disease team, which was, um, had a role in Ebola preparedness, and obviously with COVID here recently, um, um, and also with uh, ultrasound and tropical ultrasound training. Um, so that's the, the, our group and what probably what we do, um, you know, we are um, a relatively new uh, program in office. And so we are uh, actively seeking um, oppor opportunities for collaboration and, and, uh, and research as well. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Green, for sharing that overview. And um, I think the, the amount of kind of medical education focused on global health going on around UAB is really tremendous. And we look forward to helping to kind of bring that together to help all of you 
do more. Stay tuned for a talk by Dr. Neely and a couple a couple spotlights away um, on the internal medicine um, HSF program in global health. Um, so, but going to our next one, we will now welcome Dr. Simon Munga um, from coming to us from the Cameroon Health Initiative, um, representing the UAB Center for Women's Reproductive Health Global Health Fellowship. Um, and Dr. Manga, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, next slide. I just want to say that there is a heavy rainfall, rainfall here in Cameroon, where I am, and I hope that everyone should be able to get me. Um, so I want to start by presenting on the Cameroon Health Initiative at UAB, which is better known as the CAR UAB. This is a long-standing productive collaboration between faculties and leaders in Cameroon and UAB, which has a mission to improve the health of women and children through research, service, and training. And the two key partners in Cameroon are the Cameroon Baptist Convention Health Services, uh, better known as a CBCHS, and the University of Boya. So the CAI UAP collaboration was established in 2008 and is being led by Professor Tita and John Odom at UAP, uh, Professor T at the CBCHS, uh, Professor Hala Ekane and Achidi of the University of Boya. Next slide. So here are some of the examples of the CAI UAB collaboration. Um, since 2015, uh, four clinical trials with funding from NIH and met for models have been conducted within the framework of the CAI UAB. Next slide. So the CBC Health Services runs the, the largest surgical cancer prevention program in Cameroon. And the program screens an average of 8,000 women per year since 2007. Um, since 2020, I have been working on HPV research uh, among women in the general population and also among women in key population. So we use the Amphire HPV analyzer for molecular um, HPV testing and genotyping. So you can see the, the key collaborators, the faculty at UAB, who have been collaborating with me in this project. And I want to say that I'm very grateful for their mentorship and collaboration. So for new opportunity to collaborate, um, we are thinking of conducting a prospective longitudinal study on the rate and predictors of HPV clearance among women living with HIV in Cameroon. Next slide. Okay, thank you. So the key population I work with is the female sex workers. Um, in 2020, we got funding from US Prevent Cancer Foundation to screen 1,000 female sex workers for cervical cancer using visual inspection with acetic acid and glucose iodine and um, HPV genotyping for those who were 30 years and above and um, STIs. So as a major findings, we got an HPV prevalence of 63%, um, acetic acid and glucose iodine lesion prevalence was 10%, and um, STI prevalence for chlamydia, trichomatis, mysteria gonorrhea, um, trichomonas vaginalis 
and mycoplasma genitalium was 4 to 7 percent. Um, with new funding from the U.S. Oncal Cancer Foundation, uh, I'm now doing a follow-up of those sex workers who were positive for HPV and all um, acetic acid and local iodine lesions for rescreen. Um, finally, we funding from the UAP Spartan Center for Global Health. I am currently conducting a qualitative study to explore the, uh, the health challenges of female sex workers in order to develop a health promotion model for female sex workers from a woman-centered perspective. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Manga, for that lovely presentation and overview of your very exciting work. Um, our next speaker is um, my dear colleague, Dr. Esther Adekunda, um, an epidemiologist coming to us from Mbarara, University of Science and Technology in Uganda. Esther, you are welcome. <coughs> Yeah, thank you, Lynn, for and thank you, AB, for this opportunity. I'm presenting from, an, from another device. Uh, um, our network is not well, so I'll, I will just do the audio. I'll not uh, activate my video. I hope that's okay. Um, so, um, as Dr. Lynn has just mentioned, I do um, best at Mara University of Science and Technology. And as can you hear me? At least I need a sign that I'm not talking to myself. Yes, we hear you. Okay. Uh, we seek to improve maternal child health for women and families in East Africa. And our work is supported by uh, strong mentors in public health. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, there you are. Our work is supported by strong mentors in public health, in HIV, medicine, epidemiology, infectious diseases, uh, sexual reproductive health from US and Canada and Uganda. And um, we proudly um, support trainees ranging from medical students, postdoctoral fellows from programs in Boston, in Alabama, as well as Uganda. Uh, from that slide, you'll notice uh, a mix of different faces that really collaborate um, in reproductive health um, in the world, including Canada. Yeah, next slide, please. Just going to come back to this. So as a means of uh, research program, um, doctors Wana and Dr. Matthews and Dr. Moyendike started a pilot proper clinical care to men and women living with HIV and planning to have children. Uganda, which is based at Mbara Regional Referral Hospital. And this program has asked and um, uh, developed into several other programs that have uh, sprung out to support different clinical programs in response to nearly a decade of formative work um, that has suggested the need for HIV prevention in the context of the reproductive health goals for both men and women living with um, HIV or a partner with someone living with HIV. Um, from the health, health, healthy families clinical program, which is um, which was started under the leadership of Dr. Bosco Gana, rest in peace, and Dr. Matthews as well as Dr. Muyendike, uh, we've been able to spring out 
a couple of other uh, programs that are aimed towards uh, improving maternal child health for women and families here in Uganda um, and southwestern Uganda rural settings. Uh, a key point in, in, in examples uh, highlighted there, uh, we have several programs that are running uh, that have spring out from this nucleus, uh, which include uh, studies like the HIV disclosure measures for men living with HIV under the, um, the leadership uh, of Puja Chitini, who is who works at Rylam and Women's Hospital and Mass General Hospital in the USA. We also have a program uh, which we uh, call Getting to Zero that looks at safer, concepts, uh, safer conception programming to reach men living with HIV and that was funded by the Brand Challenges Canada. And the principal investigator being the lovely uh, Anja Kaida, Associate Professor, um, uh, best at the university, at Simon Fraser University in Canada. Uh, we've got also uh, the STI testing for HIV that looks at exposed couples who are planning to uh, get pregnant. Um, this is an NIH funded uh, project uh, being uh, conducted here at Mbara Regional Referral Hospital and uh, and is being led by still the lovely Puglia at uh, Chitene, who is based at Priam and Women Hospital and Mass General Hospital. Uh, uh, there is a program for evaluating ARV impact on placentas um, led by Dr. Lisa Bell, um, a member of staff for the Infectious Disease Unit. Um, have a medical school and must be in the hospital, as well as um, myself, who has sprung out from these mentorships, um, doing a couple of projects here and there. Uh, for example, the ongoing Yeah, I'm going to jump to another device. Uh, the other one went off. Um, doing quite some work on um, leveraging mHealth uh, to um, mHealth social support interventions to promote facility delivery among women, as, as well as a couple of interventions to promote family planning um, among women in Uganda. The most recent one, uh, the SHINE project, uh, that aims at exploring intersectoral stigmas among men living with HIV in Uganda. Oh, here I am again. Um, a center, center for AIDS Research Award that still supports, um, that will be supporting this research to start as early as next month. And we've got a group of um, very, very hardworking and lovely uh, team that we work with here at Mbara University of Science and Technology, as well as Mbara Region. I uh, mention um, among them is Dr. Sei Isegunganwa, who is um, a Shea, who is a postdoc fellow at UAB, the lovely and hardworking Moran Wembalazi, who is the coordinator for most of these programs here, best at Mbara University of Science and Technology, and the lovely Madeline Platt, um, uh, who is best at uh, 
UAB. The opportunities for collaboration Please slide. Esther, do you want me to take this slide? Your sound is a bit um, in and out. Lynn, please take the slides because okay. I'm switching from. <laughs> I know from one you're to you're another. doing amazing it's work switching thing. between multiple devices. It's this is a true global health conference, and you're man managing it quite well. Um, I'll just take this last slide, which is to say that um, there are I many opportunities from there. Yes, I'll just say there are many opportunities. This is a um, tertiary hospital setting with a great collaborative infrastructure and experienced investigators. Second on the continent, actually, for a K43 Emerging Global Health Leader Career Awards. The first is University of Cape Town. The second is Ember Our University of Science and Technology, of which we are very proud. Um, there's a PEPFAR-supported, well-run HIV clinic, a GCLP-certified research laboratory. We have great relationships with the Ministry of Health. The university leadership supports research among their faculty and students, amazing students, good community research infrastructure, and an excellent IRB and grants office. And so um, we would love to have more UAB collaborations. I'm going to take us um, to Dr. Neely's presentation. So there are um, three remaining global health spotlights. I think around the time those are um, ending, the Hearsink family will probably be arriving to this room and we'll take a little break. And then we'll go to um, Mrs. Hearsink's presentation and Anupa Margarwal will be moderating a question and answer session, just to give you all a sense if you don't have the agenda right in front of you. Um, Dr. Neely is an assistant professor in general internal medicine and will be sharing with us the UAHSF Gorgas Global Health and Tropical Medicine Fellowship Program. Good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity um, to share with you about the UAHSF Gorgas Global Health and Tropical Medicine Fellowship. And our mission is to equip doctors to serve abroad confidently. Um, in order for you to understand how our fellowship uh, functions, I wanted to share with you my story. So I was born and raised in Nicaragua, and since I was a little girl, um, my goal was to come to the U.S., get the best education, and then go back to my country and serve. And I had the opportunity to go to Stanford University, uh, followed by Vanderbilt School of Medicine, and then UAB for residency. In all those institutions, I pursue uh, global health tracks and actually have incredible mentors that are uh, present here today. Um, but I started taking teams to Nicaragua pretty much every year that I had been in the US. And every time I came back, even though I felt like I had an amazing education, um, I still didn't feel super confident treating patients abroad. The main reason being that um, I had a lot of knowledge, but I didn't have a lot of resources to actually help them. So I started looking at global health fellowships all over the US, trying to get those skills that I felt like I was missing, like ultrasound training, procedures, wound care, and more tropical medicine in general. And as I looked around, I um, looked at amazing schools, but none of them seemed to actually have those practical skills that I needed. It was all more research-based, which is awesome, um, uh, but also like more theoretical. So after I took Dr. Kirsten Kennedy um, with us, who's our current uh, chief medical officer, um, and Dr. McCollum um, on the picture uh, to the right. They encouraged me to actually create our um, own global health fellowship since we had so many um, incredible resources at UAB, including the Gorgas Institute. So with their encouragement, I decided to design our fellowship um, to have a lot of practical skills and uh, the UAB Gorgas Global Health Fellowship includes the training at the Gorgas Institute for Tropical Medicine in Lima, Peru. Uh, and not just that, I, I thought, you know, I have this desire to serve and help and train, but I really do need the best team with me in order to be successful with this fellowship. So I recruited Dr. Enestrosa, who is our fellowship co-director, um, to help me lead this fellowship. In addition to that, the fellowship provides um, Spanish immersion. I think that if you're going to be a leader in global health, it's important to have uh, understanding of a second language. One, because it will open a lot more doors as a global health leader, but two, so that you understand 
um, your patients that are here in the US and abroad that are unable to communicate and the struggles that they go through. Um, also decided to add the Harbor Humanitarian Response Intensive Course um, to the fellowship, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, that, um, and then multiple clinical rotations. Now our fellows pretty much go to all the continents other than Antarctica. Um, in addition to that, uh, procedure training, wound care training, ultrasound training. We have a series throughout the year, journal clubs in global health and outpatient clinics in travel medicine, um, HIV, um, TB. Um, but, you know, this fellowship has been going on since 2017, and we have graduated five fellows. And for me, what sort of the impact that the fellowship has is shown in what our fellows are doing. Um, our first fellow, Denny Hong, is currently serving in Africa. He's going to be there for the next five years, and he does feel like the training that he received um, through our fellowship has helped him uh, be a better physician for his patients there. Our second fellow um, is currently an assistant professor at Tulane, and he's teaching both global health and tropical medicine there. And then we have um, uh, a class that had three fellows, uh, that was last year's class, and Dr. Jesse Ross, who actually went to UAB um, uh, School of Medicine, he is pursuing a fellowship at uh, Columbia University for critical care combined with global health. And his goal is to open affordable ICUs um, all over the world after he's done. And we have two other fellows, Dr. Gretchen Carp Carpintero, um, Dr. Catherine Cass, who have stayed um, with our hospitalist group to be part of our global health faculty that we have created within the fellowship. And it allows them to have protected time um, to travel abroad, uh, teach, serve, um, but still have all the um, connections to the US. And then for myself, I am currently living in Nicaragua. Uh, my husband and I are opening a hospital. It's actually an eye hospital that will be doing cataract and retina surgeries. Um, for free to many patients in a rural community in Chinandega, um, which means we'll have plenty of opportunities to collaborate uh, with our friends in the U.S. that are interested in serving there as well. Um, and again, sort of like the core of the fellowship, we can go to the next slide. We kind of talked about it. Um, that's like the Gorgas Institute. Um, which was created by many people at UAB. And all of our fellows after they complete that are able to have a certificate in clinical tropical medicine, a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene. And then they qualify for the ASCMH c -trop med um, examination, which is sort of like the equivalent of boards um, for tropical medicine, since we don't really officially have um, any boards yet. And Dr. Anastasia is doing an amazing job leading the Gorgas Institute. We can go to the next slide. And then other collaborations that we have is um, in Nicaragua, um, where all of our fellows spend uh, four to six weeks of Spanish immersion. They take eight hours daily of Spanish. Uh, none of the teachers actually speak any English and they have multiple cultural experiences where they get to um, cook with the locals, they get to meet some of the local healers, learn about plants, um, nutrition. They also do um, some public health and preventive medicine uh, clinics and classes for this rural community in Cedro Galan. We can go to the next slide. And then in addition to that, our fellows also spend two weeks at Harvard um, in the Harvard Humanitarian Response Intensive course that teaches more about how to, uh, things that are essential for global health, like water, sanitation, and hygiene, how to build shelters, how to run like a refugee center, um, and how to do wilderness medicine. We can go to the next slide. Coupled with, of course, multiple international rotations, um, Currently, we've done Panama, Kenya, Zambia, Nicaragua, and Peru. Um, we're adding Australia, Singapore, um, and India in the next year. We can go to the next slide. Um, so it's very exciting to be here with so many leaders in global health. And you know, I, I think that if we are able to collaborate together, there's so much that we can do to truly make healthcare um, more accessible and deliver better healthcare, um, whatever we are. So I just want to make an invitation that if you would like to learn more Spanish, we can help you with a Spanish immersion course in Nicaragua. 
Um, if you're looking for um, public health projects where I'll be working in Chinandega, there's a already set up um, organization that's doing a lot of public health and they're always looking for more people um, to do research with. Um, in addition, if your passion is teaching, um, we do medical boot camps in Nicaragua where we basically teach the medical students that are about to be interns all about the basics of um, internal medicine, um, trauma and emergency medicine, including um, OB as well. Um, so there are plenty of opportunities that also will be the director of this eye hospital in Chinandega. So for any ophthalmologists, anesthesia, um, or even surgical residents that are interested in rotating, um, there'll be many um, opportunities for y'all to come and help in Nicaragua, uh, but also potentially in any of the other trips that we have um, with our fellows. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Wonderful. And thank you so much, Dr. Neely, for that presentation and for all of the work you are doing. Um, so I'm actually going to just pause to introduce, to let everybody know that the Hearsink family was able to, is, has just joined us. I will make the room camera show that so they can wave. Oh, but now I can't see the camera. Freddie, can you help me? I'm adjusting it, but I can't see what, what it is showing. Sorry. Or maybe it's just about my Zoom settings. Um, there we go. Okay. All right. Um, so Mrs. Mary Hearsink is on the screen if you want to say hello. Um, <laughs> and we'll give you a talk in a moment. But we have a couple more presentations. Um, and I had just said I was going to promise a break, but I actually think based on the time, I'm going to encourage people to take breaks as they would like to, but we are going to keep going through the Global Health Spotlights so that we have time for Mrs. Mary Hersink's presentation and our, hopefully have some questions and answers at the end. Um, so thank you for, for bearing with us. Um, so the next presenter is Dr. Douglas Morgan, who's going to be, who is the chair of the Department of Gastroenterology here, and we'll be talking, we'll be giving the next talk. Thank you, Lynn. Great talk, Jill. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll, if you can hear me okay, I'll probably cut off my video just to make sure we have a good connection. Hear you well. Good, thank you. No, I'd like to thank Dr. Vickers and Dr. Titta and Dr. Matthews uh, for uh, inviting me to present today and certainly to Mrs. Hersink uh, for her support and vision for this very important initiative. So thank you. Uh, following Jill's lead on a, on a personal, uh, personal note, I never imagined this uh, global health journey. I departed for Honduras as a Peace Corps engineer and returned uh, thinking about a career in, in health uh, services. And after training in gastroenterology, uh, again departed uh, for Honduras and Nicaragua in the aftermath of Hurricane Mitch and ended up on this 20-year uh, uh, detour, so to speak. Where we engaged, uh, again, echoing Jill's comments uh, in Central America, and specifically the Central America Four region, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. This is a region which is unified by history, politics, language, culture, and certainly poverty. It is an integrated region with open borders, a little bit like the European Union, which was uh, launched in 2006. And it's really the core LMIC region um, of Latin America in this hemisphere, along with Bolivia, Paraguay, and Haiti. The population is over 35 million. And if we include the immigrants from the region to the US, it's an at-risk population of over 40 million. So certainly a regional approach to global health and in our works case, cancer control uh, makes sense. And over time, we've expanded from base camps, so to speak, up in the mountains of Western Honduras uh, throughout the CA4, uh, but also with scientific collaborations with Puerto Rico, Colombia, and in Chile. I'll mention an important partner. It serves as, I think, a reasonable model in thinking forward. INCAP is the Central American Nutrition Institute. In Central America, the centers of research and excellence are usually centered in one country. For instance, agriculture, Zambrano, uh, is in Honduras. Uh, nutrition for over 50 years has been centered at the Institute, INCAP, in Guatemala. 
And it has broadened recently uh, to include and really focus on chronic diseases uh, and cancer. And really a perfect partner in the sense that it's a Central American entity. It partners with ministries of health and NGOs, but is independent of the local uh, politics, i.e. national politics, which may change uh, overnight. Uh, in other words, it's a, a stability, a very stable platform. Next slide, please. What is our focus? It's really, uh, um, over time, it's been cancer prevention and scientifically, specifically on host microbe genetic epidemiology as it relates, it relates to gastric cancer. And I only mention our work in gastric cancer really to as a window on broader global health uh, comments. With respect to cancer, 70% uh, of cancer will occur in the LMICs and uh, we have a responsibility uh, to address this. And this is specifically why Dr. Varmus, the former head of the NCI, created the NCI Center for Global Health. Gastric cancer is an important cancer. It's the third leading uh, cause of mortality globally and the leading infection associated um, cancer, uh, 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 cancer in general. Tremendous geographic variability, and this offers the, offers the opportunity for scientific discovery and focused prevention. The high incidence areas are mountainous Latin America, Eastern Asia, and parts of Eastern Europe. Importantly, in the U.S., it represents a marked racial and ethnic disparity, cancer disparity, as all uh, non-whites have double the incidence rates. So in some, it's important in leading cancer in the CA4 region among our immigrants uh, from the region and in Hispanics. Next slide, please. The gastric cancer etiologic model is really a Bermuda Triangle. And again, I, I show this for potential points of uh, uh, engagement uh, and scientific collaboration in global health. Uh, certainly, uh, infection is important from H. pylori, Epstein-Barr to the microbiome. Host genetics are very important, um, both germline mutations and tumor biology. Uh, and then uh, the other part of the triangle, dietary and environmental factors. So multiple points of, uh, for scientific discovery and prevention and multiple points for uh, potential multidisciplinary engagement. Next slide, please. I'll just mention one study uh, really to underscore the generalizability of some of the science in the region for the region, but also for immigrants in our Hispanic populations. There are two main subtypes, molecular subtypes of gastric cancer, intestinal, which is an inflammation and H. pylori driven, and diffuse, which is also H. pylori driven, but has uh, important genetic components. And we asked in our population-based uh, studies in Western Honduras whether there may be clustering of the two types. We did not see this in, in, in the intestinal subsite as visualized on the left, but did localize or identify a highly significant cluster of diffuse gastric cancers, um, again, in Western Honduras. And this, uh, given that there are many, this is predominantly younger patients, with shortened survivals, this argues for uh, germline mutations or her uh, hereditary component. And as we investigate this, um, it uh, may have implications not only for the regions, uh, but for immigrants and Hispanics uh, in the US. Next slide, please. The robust research foundation, primarily NCI funded, uh, facilitates effectively cost neutral. Sounds like, um, can you hear me okay? Yep, you're fine. Some We'll figure okay. out how to mute, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. We're um, a robust uh, research infrastructure um, has served as a foundation for cost neutral education and service initiatives. Um, in the upper right panel here, you see the teaching hospital, the National Teaching Hospital in Nicaragua and in Leon, uh, where Jill also collaborates. Uh, upper left, the regional rural hospital in Honduras, 
uh, lower left, uh, the reality uh, and integrated into our work are uh, household interviews and household engagement. And then in the, the lower right, uh, an example of, um, you'll see three engineering PhD candidates working on a novel point of care uh, technology. Uh, and this multidisciplinary uh, expansion, so to speak, was finan financed by um, a pilot grant through Global Health. Next slide, please. And in conclusion, um, I'd like to comment uh, that indeed the CA4 is at the crossroads of global immigrant and Hispanic Latino health. Uh, and three comments. Uh, first, um, that we fully expect Washington <clears throat> to significantly invest uh, in this region, the Northern Triangle, so to speak, which is in the news every day. Um, and this will include NIH uh, RFAs. Uh, and UAB, collectively, we have the infrastructure to respond. Secondly, uh, I think a pathway in training in the health sciences in Latino health uh, is, is important and potentially critical, as Latinos are now the largest minority uh, in the U.S., and many of our trainees uh, seek these opportunities. And then lastly, <clears throat> a quick comment. I first met Isabel Scarinci. Uh, in uh, 2015 at an Institute of Medicine uh, symposium on uh, cancer prevention in low resource settings. And she presented her work uh, in rural Alabama in the Black Belt, uh, which was informed by her work in Brazil. And so thinking forward, uh, the synergy between what we do here in Alabama and in settings such as in uh, rural Central America, the so-called Mayan or Maize Belt uh, may provide a unique uh, diversity platform uh, moving forward. And with that, I'll close and, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was a great overview and a very exciting area. I'm going to move us along. to Dr. Johnston, who's going to share with us if he hasn't had to go to clinic yet. Um, oh yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, great. Um, the work that he and his team are doing in neurosurgery. Great, Take well, thank away. you so much. Oh, well, oh. Uh, I guess click through that maybe to show over there. Th thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk. My name's Jim Johnston. I'm a, uh, a professor of uh, pediatric neurosurgery at Children's with UAB. and. Um, uh, I've really enjoyed hearing all of the incredible things that are going on at, at, at UAB. And, and my wish, I guess, for part of this talk is to try to let you know what we're doing in the surgery realm uh, and better ways to integrate with the broader mission of uh, UAB Global Health. So um, just as background, you know, surgery has more recently emerged as uh, sort of the, the stepchild of global health, but it's been more recognized as an important contributor to global morbidity and mortality. It's an estimated about 5 billion people around the world do not have access to uh, timely and safe surgical care. And the morbidity and mortality from surgical, surgically curable diseases um, is far larger than that to TB, uh, TB uh, HIV, and, and malaria combined to give you a sense as to what the, the global health problem is. Um, it's, it's obviously a, a very large uh, a problem that no one center can solve, but um, as a very small component of that, we established uh, the Global Surgery Program at Children's of Alabama about five years ago. And the idea was to try to better organize all the various surgical uh, um, uh, missions and, and interventions that were going on by surgeons at Children's to, to basically uh, coalesce them into a more uh, focused way for, to establish durable collaborative relationships with major children's hospitals in uh Turns out Vietnam, Kenya, and Ghana is how it's coalesced. But the idea is to really focus on surgical capacity building so that these area, these hospitals could become reference centers for their regions and do, do training within their country and beyond. So uh, we have a three activity model. One is the kind of the, the, the standard idea about surgical teams traveling to uh, these hospitals to do surgery and, and training, lectures, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, we have teams uh, that have gone from, from most of the surgical subspecialties at Children's. Um, in addition to some uh, surgical uh, uh, ad 
adjunct services like neurology for epilepsy surgery, neuropathology, oncology, uh, and electrophysiology. We also have a visiting fellows program where we host uh, either young attendings or senior residents and fellows from our partner programs uh, here in Birmingham, where they spend one to three months uh, doing work, um, not clinical work, but basically doing research training, looking at how uh, our teaching and other uh, uh, treatment protocols are set up so that they can go back and adapt some of those for implementation in their, their centers. Um, we've had visiting fellows from uh, multiple centers. Um, and then I think the third thing, which I think has become much more important or more recognized as more important since COVID is the establishment of a virtual presence and augmented reality mentoring program, which I'll talk about uh, in, a, in, a, in a few slides. Can go ahead and advance, please. So in terms of craniofacial program development, I'll just focus on some of the things that neurosurgery has been involved with, but uh, the craniofacial program development uh, has uh, um, put down very strong roots at the Confo Noche Teaching Hospital in Kermasi, Ghana. Uh, working with uh, our partners Solomon uh, Obiri in maxillofacial surgery, uh, Frank Wachi in neurosurgery. Um, on the, the right of the screen there is John Grant, who's one of my partners, and he's a plastic surgeon and craniofacial surgeon and, and uh, internationally known for his work. Um, this has is, is turned into a, a long-term relationship uh, with uh, essentially establishing the first craniofacial center in sub-Saharan Africa, outside of South Africa. Um, that is um, not just cleft repair, but also craniofacial repair. And this is really a unique thing uh, that has come about because of this longstanding relationship with multiple visits. And again, the augmented reality program, which I'll talk about in a sec. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, we've established a very longstanding relationship with Children's Hospital Number no. 2 in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Um, this uh, is a, a very busy center that does uh, the whole gamut of uh, neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgery. And what we've been able to do is sort of focus over the past uh, six years in them establishing various sub programs, including um, brain tumor surgery, uh, more advanced uh, cerebrovascular surgery, surgery for hydrocephalus, uh, including referral of, of uh, one of their um, trainees to work here and then also in Uganda to do uh, uh, more expert uh, training uh, to establish a reference center for hydrocephalus care in. Uh, not only Vietnam, but in uh, the uh, Laos, Cambodia uh, region. Um, we've had multiple papers that have come out from our collaborations uh, with the special emphasis on establishment of database, REDCap databases for our partners there and some research training so that they are uh, writing, devising research questions, writing uh, the papers, um, and also um, taking care of their databases, which I think is an incredibly important part of their growth as a center. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a second, uh, previous one, please. The, the, another very important thing that's come about uh, is a partnership in Hanoi with the National Cancer Hospital and National Pediatric Hospital. This is my partner, Brandon Rock, uh, who has established really the first ever type collaboration uh, for uh, advanced epilepsy surgery uh, using this kind of a model uh, with multiple visits. Again, like I said, with Dr. Rock traveling back and forth, also hosting not only neurosurgeons here at UAB, but also um, epileptologists, uh, EEG technicians, um, resulting in uh, multiple publications and uh, uh, what's turned into a very busy epilepsy center um, and become a model for, for our world in neurosurgery. Uh, next. Um, I think one of the interesting things that, that's come out from all of this, this was actually a paper that came out uh, in 2015, was our use, uh, really the first time it's ever been used in neurosurgery, and one of the first ever in, in all surgery was use of augmented reality software that we had adapted uh, for uh, mentoring in neuroendo and neuroendoscopic surgery. Um, this allowed uh, uh, our center partners, uh, Dr. Khan, it's him pointing there, to um, basically establish a, a endoscopic uh, program for hydrocephalus uh, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, uh, Vietnam, which has become uh, the reference center for the entire region. Um, he has sent one of his uh, attendings, young attendings, to Uganda to get a more expert training, who himself has now become a leader in uh, hydrocephalus research uh, with this technique. Um, what's interesting is that this particular uh, method we've used for augmented reality has now become a, a, a much more common way of doing this. I'm going to talk about it in a second uh, with the implementation of smart glass technology and is now being adopted by other uh, hydrocephalus and, and neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgery organizations to uh, optimize their ability to train people not only with a standard model of coming back and forth, but also to do it on a more uh, 
uh, ongoing basis, which has become a, a recognized as a very important way to, to uh, optimize this kind of training. Uh, next slide, please. Scroll through there. So the next stage of this is what we're doing now, which is basically integration of this augmented reality with um, uh, smart glass technology to allow hands-free type treatment. An example of this, uh, you can go back one slide. This is Dr. Kantong Dongdo, who is the chief of pediatric neurosurgery children's hospital number two. Uh, and we've been using this uh, technology to help him uh, to advance his particular surgical training program for more advanced craniofacial techniques, uh, not only for his hospital, but for his use of these glasses to mentor some of his mentees that he has in, in, out, in, in, in hospitals outside of Ho Chi Minh City. Um, this particular technique uh, has been adopted um, like I said, uh, by other nonprofits, the largest is Ohana One, uh, which has now had about has 50 teams uh, around the world uh, using this technology for uh, augmented reality mentoring and surgery. Uh, next slide, please. Go to the next slide, please. So one small thing I wanted to mention is another very important project, I think, which has come out of UAB and has not gotten the, the notice that I think that it, that it should, is uh, this Intersurgeon. Uh, Intersurgeon is an online platform which is established uh, by people here at UAB, as well as some financial support from Dean Vickers, as it's basically a standalone platform for all surgical subspecialties, anesthesia, equipment sharing, companies, et cetera. Uh, to allow for uh, more direct uh, collaboration, identification of projects, um, and connection between nonprofits and uh, uh, in academic institutions with individual surgeons, anesthesiologists, et cetera. Uh, there are now uh, almost 800 members, 41 uh, nonprofits in 105 countries. And I would urge uh, all uh, people here at UAB who are in the perioperative and surgical subspecialties to consider uh, looking at it, because I think it's a real resource uh, for uh, ongoing global collaboration. Again, it's a product here from UAB. Uh, next slide, please. We've established uh, a multitude of partners, including the G4 Alliance, which is the largest alliance, uh, lar largest uh, consortium of uh, nonprofits uh, focused on surgical obstetric trauma and anesthesia care as their uh, particular collaboration uh, software, uh, as well as collaborations with uh, uh, the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery, the United Nations, um, and other uh, national and international organizations. Um, and I think the more organizations that are part of it and the more individuals that are part of it, the more powerful it will be. So next stage. Next slide, please. So again, I think our overall concept is that, that these kind of inter-LMIC partnerships uh, based on digital collaboration and emph emph emphasis on education partnerships and virtual mentoring through technology will be very important not just in surgical training, but I think in all medical training. Um, and what my vision and hope is that uh, is to get a closer collaboration between the work that's being done in surgery at, at Children's and at UAB with the Global Health Program. Uh, I have friends at Harvard and the, the Harvard um, Program for Global Surgery and, and Social Change. And I see the, the power of collaboration between surgery teams with epidemiologists, implementation specialists, uh, et cetera. And I, I would love for that to have more of that as we continue to go forward. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. And I'd love to answer any questions either by email, my email is there at the bottom or after this, thank you. Thank you so much. Very exciting. And you should know some of the leads for our innovation center also in this room and probably paying very close attention to your work. So thank you so much. Um, Dr. Anna Halova is going to take us through the Sparkman Center Global Health Activities. And then um, we will be introducing Mrs. Mary Hirsink and she will give some words. So stay tuned. Thank you, Anna. You're yeah. welcome. <laughs> use Thank this you. Mouse okay. Hmm. Hello, everybody. So my name is Anna Helova and I'm a deputy director for the Sparkman Center for Global Health. We also have on Zoom with us Dr. Janet Turan, who is the director of the Sparkman Center. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the new institute and, uh, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to present about the Sparkman Center. Uh, so for, uh, first thing um, to know about the Sparkman Center, we were established in uh, 1979 as an endowed center. And so we have been 
making an impact in this uh, arena for over 42 years. While we are housed in the School of Public Health, uh, we really serve UAB community and beyond. Oops. How do I, okay, just with the... Yeah, just close that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So what is our mission? Very briefly, we try to develop sustainable approaches to advance global health equity and social justice through cutting edge interdisciplinary education, research, global health practice, and community engagement in collaboration with our UAB partners, domestic partners, and international partners. Oops. Uh, so we have, we are working under three pillars. Uh, so first pillar is the education pillar in which we try to increase global health awareness, knowledge and interest uh, across UAB, including a thriving global health studies program that attracts high quality students from around the world. So this includes our certificate program in global health studies for graduate and professional students. The certificate program is very transdisciplinary and uh, highly practical. Uh, it's also often selected as one of the two certificates to complete masters in interdisciplinary studies at UAB and often also used uh, in the School of Public Health accelerated program for our undergrads. We also uh, include other, uh, provide other immersive and experiential learning opportunities uh, for UAB students, including international internships, travel award, research opportunities. We run uh, Peace Corps prep uh, classes program for undergraduate students at UAB and also provide scholarship to students uh, for the return Peace Corps volunteers who wants to complete their master's uh, in public health at UAB. And uh, our students also compete at UAB and uh, International Emory Global Health Case Competition and doing really well in that area. Um, our second pillar is the research pillar, uh, where, we uh, where we aim to expand and um, create an impactful global health research and scholarship portfolio in schools across UAB. We provide annual research uh, pilot projects for UAB faculty and fellows. Um, we fund about three to five projects at $10,000 to $20,000 per each, uh, which then uh, translate, many of them translate in publications, collaborations, uh, and big NIH proposals. We have a really thriving and growing network of uh, UAB uh, Spartan scholars. So these are the UAB faculty engaged in global health and development. Many of you who are sitting here or, or are on Zoom call are our scholars and we are really proud of this network. We also select about 15 students every year to be our Spartan fellows. So these are students at every level of education from undergrads all the way to the medical school. And they are being matched with our wonderful scholars and work on the, on the research project of their interest, of the mutual interest. Okay. So our, uh, our uh, third pillar is the global health practice and community engagement. Uh, we have a thriving, strong partnerships uh, with domestic uh, and international partners across five continents and about 26 countries. Um, we incorporate our partners in every pillar of our Sparkman Center for Global Health, including the education, research, and, uh, and capacity building and global health practice. Uh, we, so we connect with our partners. Uh, uh, via vibrant communication strategy and social media presence. We hold monthly seminar series and have a monthly newsletter and, uh, and really great annual reports that are available publicly. And uh, we are working on development of the dashboard, interactive dashboard that will connect uh, not only our UAB partners and UAB with international partners, but also partners uh, among each other. Um, one other example of, uh, of collaboration is uh, we just held a grant writing workshop 
with the Aga Khan University in Nairobi and uh, Kenya and in Pakistan, in Karachi, Pakistan. And it was co-presented by both uh, AKU and UAB faculty members, including Dr. Buta, who is a really big name in, in pediatrics. Uh, uh, so it was a really great seminar and we have a really great feedback. Okay, so. So where do we see our, uh, our collaboration and uh, with the newly formed um, Herzing Institute of Global Health? Uh, we see lots of synergies and opportunities for collaboration, again, across all of our pillars. In education, we are, uh, we are hoping and we are working on development of the masters in global health studies. Uh, in research, we are hoping that maybe we can offer one or two annual research projects, pilot projects uh, in the area of interest. In global health practice, there are lots of synergies uh, uh, of mutual uh, interest. And so we are looking forward to the thriving collaboration with this institute. And again, congratulations and thank you for giving me this opportunity to present. Thank you. Thank you. That's just, that just uh, fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Helova, and uh, thank you to the leadership of the Sparkman Center. We look forward to uh, working together. Um, yeah, before I bring uh, to the podium, Mrs. Mary uh, Hersing, I would like to take a moment and just thank everyone for the, just the fantastic presentations today. I think this is just the beginning and we know what different people are doing across the School of Medicine and even at the Sparkman Center and we can build upon that. So I look forward to uh, getting these conversations, not going, but continuing. Um, as we uh, go on to uh, bring uh, Mrs. Mary Hersing uh, forth, I would like to say, we'll get back to uh, the, we'll get us all back on, 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 ta on time. We'll hear uh, from Mrs. Mary Hersing, and then uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Anupam Agarwal, who is the ex Executive Vice Dean in the School of Medicine to get questions from the audience directed to any uh, of the speakers. As I bring forward uh, Mrs. Mary Hersing, I want to go ahead and acknowledge um, others who are uh, in the room uh, with, with her. Uh, when I spoke earlier, I highlighted just what a boost it is, the naming of the School of Medicine, uh, the $100 million we've had, and that is going to just lead to a transformational um, a change in the landscape here, and also uh, bring forth this Institute of Global Health. Um, in the back is Dr. Manix Hersing, right in the back, a cataract and laser refractive uh, surgeon. Uh, there is Sebastian uh, Hersing uh, here, um, who is a cataract and laser refractive surgeon as well, and cornea specialist. Uh, there is Christian Hersing, who is uh, currently doing his residency and is, I, I believe, on virtually. There is Juanita Hersing as well, who is a geriatrician and I believe also uh, joining us uh, virtually. I know uh, that uh, given uh, Mrs. Mary Hersing's uh, service, not only here in the US community service, but also uh, globally in Canada and other places we have potentially have others joining us um, virtually. So I want to say welcome to everyone. So Mrs. Mary uh, Hersing is a member of the advisory board of the Master Global Health uh, Program um, that also includes a global consortium involving uh, global health institutes in the Netherlands, in India, in Thailand, in Sudan, and Colombia. And we hope that as UAB, uh, gets this boost, we will bring another flavor to that uh, consortium together with uh, our partners. Uh, Mrs. Hersing is also a community, as I said, a community volunteer in so many different areas. And that includes being on the board of visitors here at uh, the UAB uh, School of Medicine. I will go ahead and uh, 
have uh, Mrs. Helsing come forward and really look forward to hearing from you your vision uh, for global health. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tito. Thank you. Um, to advance that? Yep. yep. Just click. There you go. Well, good morning. And thank you, uh, Dean Vickers and, and Dr. Tita, uh, Dr. Matthews, Dr. Pillay, for uh, propelling this institute to improve lives across the globe. Uh, my passion for global health comes from personal experience. Thank you very much. From personal experience, uh, 30 years ago, my husband Marnix and I were busy minding our own lives when out of the blue, our eldest child, Damien, ate the wrong bite of hamburger. The result, four weeks on a respirator, lung, heart, central nervous system involvement, one code, seven surgeries, a stripped pericardium, a perforated bowel, 11 plasma exchanges, seven weeks in pediatric intensive care, and months of recovery, years of mopping up the damage. Once he was diagnosed with hemolytic uremic syndrome or HUS, I thought, well, what do I do? And I called the wisest man I knew my dad, and he had a very singular, succinct question for me. What is the etiology? Follow the etiology and that's where you'll find answers. Here it is, veritoxigenic E. coli, an emerging pathogen first identified in 1982 with its niche being the intestinal tract of cattle. In pursuit of answers to my father's questions, I naively called an investigative journalist at CDC to discuss the lack of public awareness of culturing, of reporting of these infections. And her response to me was prescient. We've been waiting for you. Now, of course, she didn't mean me personally, but us collectively as personally impacted citizens. You see, Dr. Griffin had been measuring at the accelerating clusters of disease over the previous decade. Her research made it up channel to the highest levels of our federal inspection authorities and to meet, in, meet industry trade associations. However, the industry squelched these warnings and dismissed them as a public relations problem rather than a public health threat. So her work remained corralled in the medical literature, never making it into public discourse. I turn to John Kelton, who I'm delighted to say is also here with us today. John is a Canadian hematologist who saved our boy's life. You see, Damien had received the most meticulous yet most aggressive care by John, whose intervention rescued him from a very complicated case of HUS or hamburger disease as it was described in his country's press. While I agonized about the healthcare disparities, inequities in reverse, see our boy received very advanced and proactive treatment. Many families were delivered a very fatalistic, there's no treatment, there's no cure approach, basically provide supportive care and good luck. John counseled me not to worry about the treatment issues. They would sort themselves out over time. Why don't you try to prevent children from getting sick in the first place? So the year after we brought Damien back home was one of diving into a brewing public health threat. Our family's mailbox was filling up with whistleblower complaints, Freedom of Information Act documents regarding zero tolerance for fecal contamination in meat plants and the like. There was a fax machine in our kitchen which spat out position papers from consumer groups like Government Accountability Project, Centers for Science and the Public Interest. Sure enough, the inevitable happened. A multi-state epidemic so large that finally the public was shocked by headlines 
of a lethal threat in need. I helped organize parents from that outbreak and together we founded a national grassroots organization and we pushed back on the Department of Agriculture and the meat industry who both claimed that this had never happened before, that we did not have a systemic problem with food safety. We testified before Congress, we appeared at agency hearings. These were very busy and conflict-ridden years as we tried to disentangle the dual function within the Department of Agriculture. Meat inspection was uh, actually housed within a division called marketing and inspection. And obviously you cannot be both the cheerleader and the cop simultaneously. We participated and worked extensively with the media, which who of course loved our David versus Goliath narrative. And I was asked to put a face on the problem. Of course, historically, there have been other works which had far more profound impact. For instance, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle touched off a firestorm of public outrage and resulted in the Meat Inspection Act of 1906. By the time Damien got sick, America's inspection system had not been modernized since its passage nearly a century ago. We heard very often from government and industry that we have the safest meat supply in the world. And I knew that that wasn't true from spending much time in the Netherlands where they had interventions at every stage in their farm to fork continuum. And as a result, their rates of illness are a fraction of what ours are even though the very first cases occurred in the Netherlands. And this is determined by retrospective serum analysis that we can look back. So this turned out to be a very consequential comparison when major media outlets came to view that system and reported that in the EU, there was the political will to use existing technology to protect their consumers. So what does it take to address a global health problem? So far in my story, we have a cast of characters, casualties, epidemiologists, physicians, consumer groups, regulatory agencies, industry, media, international trade partners. What we were missing was a key component and one which came from a totally unforeseen uh, field. And this is Mike Taylor, head of the Department of Agriculture's Food Safety Inspection Services, who oversaw all meat inspection. Another mom, Nancy Donnelly, who lost her only child, and I met with Administrator Taylor. And instead of defending and deflecting, he listened. See, Mike is an attorney. He soon did something very brilliant. He pulled a legalistic linchpin, which reconfigured the entire system. He declared 0157 an adulterant, meaning that product known to be contaminated with it could no longer enter commerce, and which also meant that industry and government needed to start testing for it. And they needed to design established systems to reduce the hazard along multiple control points. And here's the president signing into uh, legislation, the first modernization to inspection, which incorporated hazard analysis, critical control points, and microbial testing. So predictably, industry sued. However, litigation works both ways. And this is where Dr. Griffin at CDC played once again a pivotal, once again, a pivotal role with CDC's construction of FoodNet, which is a national surveillance system using DNA fingerprinting and mandatory reporting of infections. So now we have advanced to where we have microbial data at the food production level and clinical levels, which led to a massive recalls of product and also massive settlements for foodborne illness plaintiffs. This ushered in a true cultural shift after all, no one wants to produce uh, food which can make people sick or product, deliver product to market which can kill. In response to the heavy burden of foodborne disease, Congress enacted 
the Food Safety Modernization Act of 2011. Currently, Dr. Griffin or Patty, as we like to refer to her, is CDC's chief of enteric diseases. And Mike Taylor, who earned the name our nation's top food cop, both now serve on STOP's board of directors. Our current policy initiative is aimed at reducing salmonella and campylobacter in poultry. And thankfully, confrontation has evolved into collaboration. STOP has created an alliance with major companies. And by the way, I just heard that Chipotle and PepsiCo have joined in our alliance. Our constituent families provide the why of food safety in training videos in their training programs aimed at hundreds of thousands of their employees. So in the context of what I believe we need in global health, we need more patties, we need more mics and Johns. And the question is, how do we produce them? Our future health workers need to be able to work across not only international and cultural borders, but they need to engage across all the needed disciplines and sectors within society, whether the issue be food safety, food, food uh, security, viral pandemics, antimicrobial resistance, non-communicable diseases. We need global health workers who can engage across a very broad landscape using multiple levers of power to affect change. And this demands uh, a, a multi-dimensionality for our students. We should embrace great diversity and inclusion, and not only in those traditional senses of race and creed, national background, sex, but we should make sure they come from fields as diverse as the social sciences, as biomedicine, epidemiology, economics, business, law, cultural anthropology. So in closing, a quick update on Damien, all's well that ends well. And as his mother, I get to brag, he is very well educated. He started out with a year at this medical school. He earned a master's of public health degree in this very institution, I'm proud to say. And then he earned a law degree and a patent law degree and a European law degree and a medical degree from the University of Queensland in Australia is now in a, a residency program at Oshner. We thank God every day for his reprieve and are so proud that he is living a good and impactful life. And my husband Marnix and I have the very same aspirations for this institute, uh, which we are so humble to be connected with. We know that it too will have a very good and impactful life. So much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Th thanks very much, uh, Mary. That was just uh, what an inspirational story and your advocacy efforts have really made a huge difference. Uh, I apologize for not being in person. My wife had surgery earlier this week, so I'm uh, being a caregiver at home for her. She's doing well uh, uh, and much better. So I also apologize for missing the event last night. So really uh, in the last few minutes, wanted to open up for questions from anybody in the audience. Um, any of the six presenters, this brilliant work that is being done all across the globe uh, would open it up uh, for questions to anybody uh, in the room. Can I please just make a comment? This is Gail Castle, um, chair of our co-chair of the Board of Visitors for UAE School of Medicine. And um, I would just like to say that uh, during the time of your son's illness, I was president of the American Society for Microbiology and also chairing the board of scientific counselors at CDC. So I have used the cover of your book since then in many, many presentations. He was well aware of your work, but didn't know you. So it was my great surprise and pleasure that you joined our Board of Visitors. 
and I can't tell you the impact that you had. Um, I co-chair, or I chair, a review of science and technology at FDA in 2008 as a member of the Commissioner's Science Board, and Mary, food science, the scientists there, I mean, well, we need to have another conversation about, you know, from a regulatory standpoint, but I can't show you how impressive your work has been and what it's meant to uh, food safety all the way from Kathy Lopecki, who I'm sure your paths have crossed with Kathy, who was Undersecretary of Agriculture in my ghost her home, who's one of the champions of, of food safety for a very long time. Congratulations and thank you so much for the donation and for including the you know coming through from you. <laughs> One of my heroes that I just means so much. Thank you. Um, I just can't tell you what it's meant to me. All right. I don't know if you all could hear that conversation, but I've, just for people um, in the room, speak speak up. It was beautiful. All right, Dr. Agarwal, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Um, other questions or comments? Gail, thank you for those comments. Uh, um, really appreciate them. Uh, hi there. Uh, if I may, I have a uh, probably a question and a comment. Um, I, hi, I'm Mark Fedlovich. Uh, I'm on the uh, Patient and Family Advisory Committee uh, for UAB Hospital. So I'm a um, you know uh, patient advocate, and um, you're you just Mary you went through that with such clarity so quickly that was amazing. Um, just a couple days ago, I was you know turned on to all of this happening with the with you know, piercing your donation, being named and all of this. And um, I ran across your book and your story and it was like a lightning bolt because a semi-similar uh, thing happened to me. My uh, father passed away from sepsis, um, from uh, in, a tainted like uh, injection that he got that, from a bacteria. Um, and I felt like I was a little bit like you. I just started calling people and finding out who could answer questions. Um, it was in the midst of patient advocacy for something already. Um, so it felt like, wow, an aggressive twin spirit. That's amazing. Um, but <laughs> I, um, I've, everyone here does such amazing work. I'm absolutely blown away hearing everything. Um, I work in like, you know, addressing health disparities and access and just continuity of care and health literacy in Alabama. So I seem like the most boring person here. Um, and I should probably be in whatever you may be having for the, um, for your Institute for Biomedical Innovation, but I wasn't sure where that was and I wasn't gonna miss this meeting because I knew you were going to be here with your amazing story, and I wasn't going to miss a chance to say that I'm madly impressed, and um, I want to know more plus everything. Thank you for having me. Mark, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Mary, do you want to respond? Well, I'm, I'm very humbled by that. I'd love to talk further about your work. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not your work. Um, I'm sorry about your father. But these are avoidable deaths, especially at this point in our history where we, we can do so much. Thank you. Mark, again, very sorry about your father's death as well. And um, we will love to get you connected for sure. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Uh, Alan, do you want to wrap up uh, in terms of next steps and goals? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. And uh, again, thank you everyone who's been uh, here listening. Um, we look forward to hearing uh, from you. I want to, uh, yes, M high, next steps. Um, I want to uh, really extend uh, our sincere gratitude to uh, uh, Ms. Mary Hersing. Uh, Dr. Manik's 
Hersing and the entire Hersing uh, family. I also want to say thank you, John, uh, uh, Dr. Kelton, um, uh, who we've uh, had some conversations uh, with and has been very instrumental in uh, helping us uh, get this uh, uh, donation. So thank you, Dr. Kelton, uh, to you and uh, your wife. Um, so what are we doing uh, going forward? We want to keep the momentum going and having these uh, conversations. We want to move forward with the MSc in Global Health Program uh, with hopes of starting uh, by the fall of 2023. It's gonna be tough to do that, but we're, we're working on it. And as you just heard from the Sparkman Center, collaborating with them um, on, on building upon uh, the work that they are already doing in education. Uh, we want to identify a strong educational program uh, lead for the Institute and, and then operationalize our partnership with the McMaster University, uh, where Dr. Kelton uh, comes from, and uh, the Global Health Consortium. We, we want to continue these consultations and finalize a strategic plan over the next five years, uh, for, sorry, for the next five years in a few months, and then boost global health scholarship, all the things that I mentioned earlier. Uh, earlier. Uh, grow our global health research service and capacity building initiatives, continue to build on philanthropic support and getting extramural grants to keep this work going. And then really think about some transformational initiatives around telehealth and uh, diagnostic capacity with our partners that could also help provide some sustainable uh, income generation uh, to keep the work going in those uh, areas. And we've seen some great examples here to work with. Um, we, uh, together with Dr. Matthews, we like to keep, uh, you know, milestones and, and this is uh, the progress going uh, forward today, the open house um, happened and we will continue the consultations that we are having with uh, leaders and also uh, Dr. Matthews uh, speaking with faculty and our international partners to get their input into what we are doing as, as I highlighted earlier. Um, Nothing for us without us. And so this has to be uh, a great uh, collaboration uh, going forward. Um, just some nuts and bolts uh, uh, things, um, expressing some of the uh, wishes of our uh, global health stakeholders, uh, pilot grants, um, uh, you know, helping with coordination. Uh, we want to work towards an advisory board that's truly representative and also uh, plan to talk to the Board of Visitors uh, soon in the spring coming up and then move towards really building momentum and uh, having a global health symposium that, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully will have a truly hybrid in-person component and uh, a virtual component. So with that, I want to say thank you. You have our contact information. And to go back to this uh, slide from early on, the task is great, but together we can do it and plant seeds that will germinate and continue to improve health in all areas. So thank you for making time with us and uh, please have a great uh, rest of your day. Thanks everyone.